Well, today we're going to be talking about the first Star Trek, all right? Um, and so, you know, we're going to be talking about Captain Kirk and, and all that. How many, of you, how many of you are fans of the original Star Trek, okay? We've got some original Star Trek fans. Um, I grew up in the, the 80s and the 90s, so I grew up on Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, some of y'all remember uh, all those characters. Me and my dad used to stay up late on Saturday night, and we would watch that uh, together uh, on whatever station it was it was on, I guess CBS. But you know, since those two original classics, they've come out with a bunch of other junk. Um, uh, Star Trek shows. I mean, they've got Star Trek, you know, all kinds of stuff. And um, but you know, it's kind of interesting how this show that was pretty hokey even for its day back when it originally came out became such a cultural phenomenon of of going out and um, you know what is it to explore strange new worlds to go where no man has to boldly go where no man has gone before right well today we're going to start talk about a star trek that goes even further back than those original star treks all the way back to the birth of jesus and talking about the wise man and the wise men who followed the star to find the baby Jesus. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2 today. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 12. We're going to talk about how these wise men um, who came from far, far away came. They followed the star uh, to find Jesus. So if you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 2 and you'd like to stand as we read God's Word, you can do that. Um, We're going to start in verse 1 and read through verse 12. And it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this story of the wise men who came from the east to pay tribute to uh, uh, to the new king. We pray that as we uh, read through this story today and as we try to apply it to our lives, you'd help us to see how we too can continue to seek after Christ and give him our best. Thank you for your love for us, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to kind of quickly go through this story and, and see some, some basic truths and principles that we can apply to ourselves. And so the first thing that we see is that when you search for God, you will always find Jesus. When you search for God, you're going to always find Jesus. And these, these wise men were, they had seen the star of a new king, and they knew that something new was coming in Israel. And so they were coming to find this new king, and it led them to Jesus. John MacArthur says, because of their combined knowledge of science, agriculture, mathematics, history, and the occult, they became the most prominent and powerful group of advisors in the Medo-Persian and subsequently the Babylonian Empire. Historians tell us that no Persian was ever able to become king without mastering the scientific and religious disciplines of the Magi and then being approved and crowned by them. So uh, these were no slackers, right? <laughs> these, weren't, uh, any, these weren't high school dropouts. You know, these were guys who had been studying and studying and studying most of their lives. And they knew astrology. Uh, the, you know, they understood the stars. They understood religion. And so whenever they saw this certain star, they probably already understood, uh, had a good understanding of Jewish and Hebrew culture and Jewish religion. And so they were able to put these things together and realize that the foretold, the, pre, the prophesied Jewish Messiah had been born. This new king uh, had been born. And so they came searching and they found Jesus. For us as, as uh, Christians, and if, even for us before we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, as we 
seek after meaning in life, as we seek after ultimate uh, meaning in life, if we seek hard enough, it's always going to point to Jesus. It's always going to direct us to Jesus, because as we seek after God, we're going to find Jesus. Timothy says in 1 Timothy, or Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. You know, as we seek God, we have access to God because of our faith and our relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the one who has paved the way and made it possible for us to have a connection with God. Colossians 1, 15 and 19 through 20 tells us, He is the image of the invisible God, for God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile everything to Himself. See, the thing about that baby born in a manger is that in a way that we can't completely understand or comprehend, somehow God himself had taken on flesh. That that person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son in the Trinity, had, had put on flesh, had clothed himself in flesh, had become fully and completely a man. And, well, I guess not a man yet, but a baby, a human, and was born on that night. And so the, the fact of Christmas and that we, or that we celebrate here at Christmas is that God became one of us so that he could save us. It's like we talked about last week in that riches to rags to riches story. Jesus came down. He put on that flesh so that we could then share in his glory. And so whenever you seek after God, you're going to find Jesus. And the second thing we can see in this story is that when you find Jesus, you'll give him your treasure. When you find Jesus, you'll give him your treasure. These these wise men, these were kings. And I want you to think about what their expectations were when they set out on their journey. They're like, man, this is... This is somebody who has been foretold, somebody who has been prophesied from hundreds of years ago. For centuries, the Jewish people have been waiting for this king, and we spotted his star in the sky. This is so significant that we need to take a journey that's going to take us weeks, maybe even months to go. We're going to get a caravan of people. We're going to go with us. Uh, You know, the song, We Three Kings of Orients Are, you know, they may not have necessarily been royalty, but they were at least qualified to be royalty. And so they came all the way to uh, Jerusalem, and they went to the obvious place where you would go if you were looking for a king, right? They went, to, uh, they went to, the, to the castle. They went to the throne room. They went and saw the current king and said, hey, we're here to give tribute to your child. <laughs> Basically, it's kind of what they were saying. Let's, let's see your baby. There's been a new king born. It's got to be from your household, right? And Herod was greatly disturbed, and all Jerusalem was greatly disturbed because these guys from... <laughs> Way out east, they come and said, hey, hey, your new baby, your new king has just been born. Where is he? And so they were expecting to come face to face with royalty, to, to give their gifts off to, a, you know, to, the, to the mother and the father of a, of a royal baby. But they didn't find him in the, in the throne room. They didn't find him there in the king's house. It wasn't until they got to just a lowly house, probably on some side street back uh, in the village of Bethlehem that they found the baby, Jesus. And can you imagine those kings walking in with all their pomps and circumstance, with all their, you know, bright robes, and, you know, those, those wise men with all their bright robes and all their riches, all their people, their servants with them, and they come into this little humble home. They present their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They kneel down before a peasant baby that was born to just this young mother and a carpenter. How amazing it is that even whenever they found Jesus, instead of saying, nope, we're not going in that house, or nope, this can't be the real king, they offered their gifts to him. And we see those gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they really represent something for us as well. You know, by giving gold, gold was something that is valuable, right? That's, that's kind of your best. If you, uh, you know, in that day and time, that was, their, that was the, the most precious metal that you could give to somebody. And so that was representing giving Jesus our first and our best. And that's what we need to do as believers as well. It doesn't necessarily mean that we uh, give him all of our money, even though we recognize that all of our money belongs to him. It's a gift from him. It's to be used for his glory as a resource that he has given to us. But it means that we give him the first and the best of everything that we have. All of our time, all of our abilities and our talents, and all of our resources belong to the Lord. And we give back a portion of what he has given to us. And that's what these kings did by giving the gold. Uh, they also gave him incense, which represents giving him our joyous worship. We don't do that here, but in Jewish culture, 
uh, back then, they would uh, offer incense, and so they would put incense on the altar, you know, just, you know, just like if you've ever gone into a, uh, uh, if you've ever been into one of those stores that they sell incense, like going over to World Market or something like that, like that. and you see, you kind of smell all these kind of unusual smells, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, um, that's the incense that they've got burning there in, in World Market. Well, they did that as a part of their worship there in the Jewish temple. They would uh, burn incense on the altar of incense as a fragrant offering to the Lord. And so by offering incense, that, uh, that frankincense to Jesus, they were as kind of a symbol of offering worship, of offering worth, showing that he was valuable. And then the last thing was myrrh. They gave him myrrh. What was unusual about myrrh is that myrrh is a very, very expensive embalming spice. And so that's what they would have used to prepare a body following its, following its death. And so, you know, these wise men came and they brought that as, a, as an expensive gift. But we as Christians see that really that was a fore, foretelling of what was going to happen in Jesus' life, that he was truly born to die on our behalf. And so the myrrh we, it reminds us to give him our life and our loyalty. Just like Jesus came to give his life for us and out of love for us, we give our life back to him and we live our life in loyalty and in honor to him. We live our lives as a sacrifice towards Jesus. And so we can see that, um, that whenever we seek after God, we find Jesus. When we find Jesus, we'll give him our treasure. And then thirdly, once you've met Jesus, you won't go home the same way. Once you met Jesus, you won't go home the same way that you came. Now, that doesn't mean that literally if you get saved today, you have to drive home by a different route. <laughs> if you came on Highway 69, you know, to get here to church, you've got to go down the back road, get on old Jacksonville, go home. That's not what that means, obviously, right? Now, the, the wise men, that's what they did, right? They met Jesus, and then they were revealed in a dream that they should go home another way, so they went home a different direction. But what we mean in this is whenever we say that you won't go home the same way that you came, you're going to be a different person. You're going to go home on a different track of life than the one on which you came because you realize that now you have a new person that you're following. Whenever Jesus was uh, going about his ministry, he was amassing massive crowds. People were coming and they were following him and um, he began to say some things that began to kind of turn some of them off of following him. All of a sudden, the things that he was expecting from them got a little bit difficult, and many of them turned away. And uh, we, hear, we have this story here in uh, John chapter 6, and it says, From that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. So Jesus said to the twelve, You don't want to go away too, do you? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? For you have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. You know, when you come to know Jesus as your Savior, when you seek after God and you have an encounter with Jesus, and whenever you offer yourselves, yourself to Him in obedience and, and, and uh, trust, and He gives you that eternal life, you are changed from the inside out. You are a new person. And the, the, Paul tells us that uh, all old things have gone away. Behold, everything has become new. And so whenever you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you go home a different way than from which you came. And so if, if you give your life to Jesus Christ today, if you're not a believer, then you walk out of here with different credentials. Let's put it that way. You walk out of here no longer as somebody who is lost, but somebody who is found. You walk out of here no longer somebody who is an orphan, but somebody who is an adopted child of the King of Kings. You walk out of here as somebody who doesn't have a spiritual family and walk out of here with, you, you come in with, as somebody who doesn't have a spiritual family, you walk out as somebody who does have a spiritual family. You walk in as somebody who is destined for eternity in hell, separated from God, and you walk out as somebody who has a permanent place in the home of God the Father. And so you come in here as one person, you walk out as another and whenever I say you come in here, obviously I don't mean that you have to get saved here in this building. This building is just metal and sheetrock and wood. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. But what I say is that whenever you come to Christ, whether it's here in this room this morning, whether it's at the lunch table this afternoon, whether it's at your bedside this evening, or whether it's any time else, when you come to Christ, you, you, you walk away as a changed person. And so what I want to encourage you to do this morning 
You know, as we even think about preparing to take this Lord's Supper, there may be somebody here in this room who has never surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. You've never come to the point where you realize, you know what, I am a sinner. I have no hope outside of myself. There, there is no way that I can, I can change myself. Maybe you've been, you know, you've been walking this life and living this life for a long time, and you've realized over and over and over you've tried to change. You've tried to become a better person. You've tried to get over that struggle in your life that you just can't seem to get past on your own. Well, the good news is that there is somebody who was born in a manger, who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross for our sins, and who offers you eternal life, who offers you the opportunity not for you to have overcome those issues, those struggles in your life, but for him to overcome them on your behalf so that you can then live in his victory. And that person is Jesus Christ. So this morning, if you've never come to the place where you have surrendered your life over to Jesus and and accepted that forgiveness that he offers, I would encourage you to do that today, to realize that that's what Christmas is all about, is the birth of a king, is the birth of Jesus Christ who came here for this specific purpose of dying on the cross in your place. And if you'll put your faith in him, he'll wash away your sin, he'll restore you to a relationship with God the Father, and you will receive, in that instant, you will receive eternal life a life that can never be taken away, a relationship that can never be severed again. And so if you've never given your life to Christ, when we pray here in a moment, I want to just invite you to do that. For those of us who are believers, we, we have a challenge that lays before us. That challenge is that we, will we be the star that leads somebody to Jesus? You know, we are called as believers not to just accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, but then to proclaim the forgiveness of of Jesus Christ, to be like those shepherds who came and saw Jesus there on that night and then went out rejoicing and celebrating and telling everybody that they came into contact with. We have a responsibility to share the love of Christ with others. Daniel 12, 3 says, those who have insight will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. You know, that's the purpose for which we're still here. We're, the purpose for which we're still here is to point people to God, to give God glory by introducing other people to Jesus Christ, by pointing people to Jesus in our own lives. Whenever somebody looks at our life and they say, you seem like you've kind of got things together, it's like, look, I'd be a mess if it weren't for Jesus. Or how do you have so much peace in the midst of all this turmoil that we're going through? Well, I'd be a mess too if it weren't for Jesus. Jesus is the one who has changed my life, and I'm no longer the same because of what he's done in my life. And so for those of us who are believers, we have that task before us to share the love of Christ with the world around us. But as we prepare to to celebrate the Lord's Supper today, we as believers also need to just kind of analyze ourselves and analyze what's going on in our own hearts. And so we're going to have a time of reflection. I'm going to invite uh, Dave to come up and um, lead us in a just kind of, he's going to play in the background as we uh, kind of have this time of of reflection and just really a time alone with the Lord. Um, You know, Paul encourages us to to analyze ourselves before we come to the the table so that we don't um, take the Lord's Supper uh, in an unworthy manner. And what that means for us this morning is that we need to make sure that we are in a, a right relationship with the Lord, that we as Christians have not been taking the Lord's for granted. Um, you know, we can oftentimes go about life, even as Christians, and, and we can kind of uh, live in such a way where we're taking the grace of Christ for granted, where we are um, underestimating, or maybe, uh, uh, maybe underestimating the grace of Christ or overestimating our worth. And we get to the point where we think we can just live however we want to live. We can do whatever we want to do because it's been covered by the grace of Christ on the cross. And Paul tells us that's not at all how it should be, that we should truly live in obedience to him day by day, that we should, because of the grace, we should seek to live even in more obedience to Christ through the power of the Spirit. And so I want to encourage just if everybody would uh, bow their heads, close their eyes this morning. I just want to encourage you, as, as, as Dave plays for us, um, just to spend some time with the Lord. Ask him to reveal areas in your life that you need to hand over to him again, that maybe you've been holding on to, or places where you haven't had trust um, like you should have. And just, I want to encourage you to 
confess anything that could be between you and God at this time. So would you pray? Would you spend some time in prayer right now?